been a while. Uh, we were unable to have our meetings last week, um, but I'm glad that we can get the ball going today. Um, I would like to first indicate I'm not going to turn my camera on for a while. One is Trevor. So, a member of the Ad Hoc Committee on the shortly, um, and then we'll resume to normal business. So, my apologies in that regard. Uh, the second point is. That the reason why we are starting at nine so that there's at 11 and uh, we do it the presidency from nine to 11 um, and then we will do the uh, parliamentary legal services report back to us on the road accident fund matters uh, afterwards because we had intended to start with those but we'll end with those um, so the minister is with us until 11 and uh, the deputy minister is sent in an apology uh, honorable Hatte will join us at 9 30 and uh, Honorable uh, Mazamban is uh, not in. So what I'll do without, and um, the head of the SIU, uh, Advocate MTB, is not in today. Dr. Wells is here, so the, all, but all teams are present. So without any further ado, let me hand over to the Minister and the Presidency and get going. Uh, Minister, uh, over to uh, you. Honorable Chair, I'm oh, here. Oh, Advocate, you are here today. Okay, fantastic. Yes, yes. All right. Okay, Thank you. perfect. Thank you. Okay. No, 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 uh, that's fine. All right, welcome, advocate. Thank, thank you. Can I hand over to you, and then we will take it from there. Uh, thank you, Honorable Shengwa, the Chair, members of the Portfolio Committee, SCOPA, your team in its entirety. Again, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, as undertaken, to allow us to continue to engage you on a process of dealing with the issue of the progress report on the SIU, on, or, or how are we progressing with regard to SI, SIU findings. But before I do that, if you don't mind, Honorable Chair, I will ask Matsieti to introduce a team and Advocate Matiba to introduce the yes. Uh, DDG Matsieti shared corporate service presidency, Matsieti. Um, good morning, uh, and thank you, Minister, and good morning to the chairperson, um, committee members, and uh, other colleagues on the on the call, including colleagues from the SIU. Um, Minister, as uh, you and the committee would be aware, this is a, a core shared responsibility between the presidency and, and DPME, uh, but also it would not have been possible without our strategic partner, in this case, being the SIU. So I'm joined by um, Dr. Jonathan Tim uh, from the, uh, the Department of uh, Monitoring and Evaluation. I'm also joined by um, Dr. Mpapuli um, from the presidency, who is the acting head of our legal executive services. And, um, and those will be the colleagues uh, from my side to the, to the minister. Uh, I'll hand over to Advocate Motivi, and then Minister will deal with your office, of course. Thank you, Ba. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Honorable Minister, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, my colleague, uh, DDG. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members of SCOPA. Um, uh, Honorable Chair, you're right. We did indeed submit an apology that I would not be able to attend today due to the NCOP meeting that was supposed to happen today. So we were, we were informed uh, late yesterday that it was rescheduled. So uh, that, that allowed me at least to be, to be present. My team is as follows. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Mr. Pranesh Maharaj. He is the chief uh, program portfolio uh, officer in SIU dealing with matters uh, of proclamations and referrals and follow-ups, uh, and, and um, uh, he's been relaying with the with, with the presidency team, uh, dealing also with uh, Dr. Jerome Wells. He's the chief legal counsel. Uh, he of course ensures that all those referrals 
to the litigation process and the recoveries and freezes uh, are really well attended to. Mr. Leonard Becheto, he is the Chief National Investigations Officer. All the investigations are happening uh, under his auspices. He ensures that the investigations are done properly. And then I'm also joined by Mr. Keza Khanyaho, uh, who is the spokesperson uh, of SIU, ensuring that the public really understands uh, our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thanks, and Honorable Chair. Thank you, Advocate, uh, Ad Advocate Matiba. Thank you, DDG, uh, Shared Corporate Service. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan, and thank the entire team. On my side in the office, I'm with Mr. Mabuza Mungani, who is our parliamentary liaison. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Without uh, further ado, we are here to take further our engagement with regard to the processing of reports submitted by the Special Investigation Unit and the progress regarding a disciplinary matter of the DG Public Works. Those are two issues that we'll be dealing with. And having said that, I, I, I thought I wanted to say up front, I'm very much excited about the seamless relationship between the president and SIU in working on this matter. But what I want to say is that we, what we are going to share with you today uh, is, is a progress with regard to regarding a mechanism that we are putting together to coordinate and monitor SIU reports. And then we will actually share with you the background on how that mechanism is being established. That will actually we'll share with you the approach. And then uh, we'll also share with you the process mapping, uh, progress on prototyping, monitoring capability. In other words, we'll share with you how are we putting together a version or a design that will actually be a format to ensure that going forward, there's an automatic way of dealing with this matter. And of course, we'll share with you the analysis of the three categories of reference. In a nutshell, Honorable Chair, what we're trying to say is that we took a view to develop a system of relation with the SCOPA and Parliament, put that system together, a system that is going to outlive us a system that is going to strengthen the institution of accounting to parliament on a matter like this. So this, the, 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 the nature of our conversation will actually demonstrate uh, that humble attempt. Uh, without further ado, I would request uh, uh, DDG Matsiet, I don't know whether it's you or Jonathan, is that Jonathan? Yes, Minister Jonathan is going to lead the, the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Jonathan, take, you, take us through. He's a, he's a leading technician in putting together this process that actually assists us to work in a sustainable manner and account in a sustainable manner, in a manner that will outlive us in as far as accountability in this area is concerned. Mr. Jonathan? Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Minister, and good morning to the Honourable Chair, the Honourable Members of of SCOPA, um, Advocate Motibi, and all other um, colleagues uh, in this meeting. Um, thank you very much, um, Minister and, uh, and Chairperson, for this opportunity. I have a presentation I would like to take the committee through, so I'm going to share it. Um, I'll switch my video off uh, at this point, if that is acceptable. May I just request that the uh, confirmation that the um, presentation is visible on the screen? Yes, that it is. We can it, see. It is to me. I don't know, Honorable Chair, to you. Uh, yes, we're good to go. It's quite visible on our side. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So the uh, minister has covered the purpose of this presentation. Um, and has given an indication of the contents. Uh, I, I will be dealing with the first part. Um, uh, uh, Didiji Mechwa will deal with the second matter uh, in relation to the disciplinary uh, matter. Um, 
So let me just, by way of a background, remind the committee that uh, the Honourable Minister um, appeared before SCOPA on the 1st of February. Um, and at this uh, 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 meeting, the Minister was candid in the recognition that the administrative systems within the presidency or the administrative system with regard to processing the SIU reports uh, lacked a um, capability that needed to be uh, addressed. And um, also recognizing that the both the SIU and the presidency were constrained by a, a poor um, level of responsiveness from implementing institutions to which referrals were made, again, indicative of, of, of the lack of a, of a robust system to, 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 to monitor and ensure compliance. Uh, another dimension was the, the need for uh, developing more formalized consultation mechanisms um, with the various uh, implementing um, departments and entities to ensure timeliest um, implementation, uh, as well as intervention where there were problems uh, uh, in terms of the implementation of the recommendations. So the committee and the minister agreed that, uh, but, uh, that both presidency and DPME um, uh, would urgently develop a mechanism to improve coordination and monitoring of the recommendations arising from the SIU investigations. And so this report provides an update on the, on the work done to date um, in developing the mechanism. And as the minister indicated, it sets out the approach, a methodology, a progress made, as well as providing some uh, insight to the uh, really preliminary analysis that this um, mechanism has been able to produce. So we are really uh, uh, sharing a, a uh, uh, giving a, an insight, a snapshot into a dynamic process um, that is quite complex, um, but nevertheless, I think is delivering um, some very valuable um, um, uh, uh, energy and, 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 and value, I think, uh, to, to all involved. Um, <clears throat> this slide just unpacks a typology of um, referrals and recommendations uh, or actions arising from the investigations of the SIU. Um, we, there are five cate categories. Um, our focus in building this mechanism has concentrated on um, the middle three um, categories, criminal referrals, referrals for disciplinary actions and referrals for administrative action. Um, we are uh, uh, obviously interested in all five of these categories, but um, the, the, the starting point for us, the focus has been really on uh, referrals um, for criminal investigation or prosecution, referrals to accounting officers for disciplinary action um, where officials have been implicated in wrongdoing, as well as uh, referrals, um, again, to either accounting officers or regulatory bodies and agencies where um, either individuals or, 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 or companies and uh, entities have been implicated in malfeasance around um, uh, procurement um, or, or delivery of services. Um, so this slide just provides a little bit of insight into the different types of um, actions arising from the SIU's um, investigation reports. Um, um, uh, this slide just uh, gives an overview of the, this project. Um, that uh, we are, 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 are driving in order to create this mechanism uh, in the sense of the objectives that we're shooting for. So we really, there's, a, there's an a, ambition to create a networked database system that will provide on-demand access to the implementation status of the referrals of the SIU. And, and to build this, business intelligence platform, which we think of really as a system of systems, 
through establishing information sharing mechanisms across a value chain, the, 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 the full value chain that oversees and implements the recommendations contained in SIU reports. I think the committee would, would, would um, appreciate that the implementation dimension is a very complex ecosystem um, where there are a number of moving parts, not necessarily all located in a single um, uh, department or entity, but it requires uh, co cooperation and collaboration across different um, parts of what is what 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 should be seen as a value chain. Um, and in order to build this system, uh, the, the the approach that we are following is a problem solving one. So identifying where there are near term blockages to to moving the dial and digging into those problems. Um, as well as aiming at a smart deployment of technology, um, recognizing that this kind of complex, fast moving dynamic um, uh, uh, environment is not conducive to the design of or, or, or trying to bring in a turnkey system that is developed outside of the environment and then uh, imposed into, this, in, into the environment. Um, um, but rather, it, this system needs to evolve through leveraging opportunities and facilitating enhancements within the existing environment. So um, one of the key uh, um, uh, um, approaches to this is to <clears throat> define the high-level business processes that articulate an integrated and full value chain of the recommendations emanating from the president's proclamation. So from the point of initiating an investigation all the way through to finalizing um, the recommendations. Um, I'll touch on this later, but you know, in, in, in a sense, this is a, a complex ecosystem that has evolved organically. And this one of the core components of this effort is to try and make this current state this business process explicit so that we can see how a recommendation in in any particular category would flow through all of its component parts to completion um and and as part of this the the, the um, ambition is to, is to to create clearly defined roles responsibilities standard operating procedures and rules so that we can um have a business process sorry about the slides moving um, across the full value chain, um, and that these standard operating procedures and rules will be developed and agreed through ongoing engagement and troubleshooting with the stakeholders, creating um, one of the outcomes we're hoping to achieve is to, is to embed and create a practice and culture of continuous improvement in this system or system of systems. So our approach is to start uh, you know, to try and eat the uh, elephant one bite at a time. Our starting point has been uh, to look at the recommendations and referrals arising from what is popularly known as the PP PPE investigation report, which arises from Proclamation 23 of 2020, looking into um, the COVID-19 procurement issues, which was very you know, much in the public um, domain. Uh, as well as looking at uh, um, referrals and recommendations from the most recent financial years. So these are really uh, opportunities to troubleshoot and take specific cases and track them through the system and see how they flow. So we have been engaged in a, an in-depth discovery process with, with all the relevant stakeholders to understand and map current business processes across the entire implementation ecosystem. We use this term, this term has, has as best described the environment that we're working in, an ecosystem um, where, where a number of different uh, 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 parts sort of interact with each other to create a certain, a certain environmental condition. Um, and, and I think, uh, we, 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 yeah, uh, let me not continue on that line. Um, so this business process mapping, together with um, developing a, a monitoring and analytical capability through engaging with existing data sets, as well as data systems, in order to start the process of monitoring performance and detecting challenges in implementation across the value chain. 
And the third dimension of our approach is to intervene to address identified plot problems in implementing SIU recommendations. So it's very much an intervention uh, you know, where, we, where we discover a problem collectively, we try and uh, uh, solve, solve and, and develop um, uh, 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 solutions. And then the, the institutionalization of this mechanism will, uh, it, it is being done based on this problem-driven iterative and adaptive process. We are not yet um, clear exactly how this mechanism should be institutionalized because as we discover more, so the thinking evolves. This slide just shows our current um, uh, 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 project approach uh, from, from February um, to, the, to the finalization of our first, um, what we have termed action learning cycle. We are approaching this in roughly three month action learning cycles of plan, do, check, and then adjust. So we are, 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 are at the, Sort of mature end of this first phase, which has been a, um, um, gone through a series of, of sprints. We've adopted an agile project management approach where we have short, intense sprints focusing on particular parts of the system. For example, uh, disciplinary referrals, digging in deep with uh, SIU uh, and, and DPSA, administrative referrals with National Treasury, etc. Um, this is just, again, an, a, another insight into our project management uh, tools. Here you can see um, the, the discovery, process mapping, and prototyping dimensions of the project. Um, I think as, at, at, a, at a very high conceptual level, this slide describes um, the two core focuses of the project, which is pro, uh, a, a prototyping um, an analytical mon uh, a monitoring capability. So a technical capability, looking at using um, uh, ICT technologies, particularly existing assets within various different um, environments within DPME presidency, within, um, within SIU. And, and uh, uh, so how do we begin to use this? Starting simple using uh, spreadsheets, using available technologies, available capacity. And then the other dimension is the process mapping. And I think from now the presentation will go into a bit more detail to give you uh, insight into how this mechanism is actually evolving. So we'll start with uh, exploring the process mapping dimension. We also refer to this as value chain mapping. Um, so uh, why are we doing this? Um, the ecosystem for implementation has evolved organically. It was never explicitly designed. It has just, it has evolved organically. And a lot of the shortcomings are a result of, the, of gaps between different parts of this ecosystem that have not been, um, uh, interfaces have not been created, Pro uh, protocols, procedures have not been uh, uh, um, uh, uh, explicitly articulated. So we're seeking to make them explicit and then to enhance them where we see there are opportunities for inefficiency um, and, and working very much with the people who are man and organizations mandated to do this. And so this, this exercise is core to developing both the coordination and monitoring functions of this, um, of this, uh, of this mechanism. So what are we aiming to produce? Um, we're aiming to produce a process map for each type of referral, as well as the entire value chain. And once this is explicitly articulated, we can begin to look at, um, at, at defining standards, uh, at, at uh, how to um, monitor the process, how to escalate. Um, but, it, you know, that, that adage of... Um, <clears throat> You can't um, uh, 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 sort of what you what you can't manage what you what you can't monitor. Um, so you need to see it in order to be able to 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 actually uh, move the dial. So and this mapping process will allow for improved integration between uh, organizations as well as identify opportunities where technology can be used to automate um, uh, as well as performance monitoring. So how long will this take? Um, so we are uh, at an advanced level of having a, an as-is map of the ecosystem. And this has been done through uh, in-depth discussion of, of, with each of the component parts, the officials involved in, in 
uh, in each of the processes to map out what they do, how long it takes, and to make a map of this. So, so we're going to have this as-is ecosystem map in place by the middle of June. And then really, the, the process will then move towards reaching towards an ideal state. Now, we don't yet actually know what that ideal state looks like because of the complex environment where you've got so many moving parts. But we're taking a problem-driven, iterative, and adaptive approach um, to, to, to realizing this ideal state. So this will be an ongoing process of, uh, if we succeed in this, we will have created a culture of continuous improvement where each of the component parts have uh, a, a, a vested interest interest in improving efficiencies. And so how will this help uh, uh, in implementing SIU referrals? Well, it's going to identify very specifically where there are blockages in the implementation process. And it will enable monitoring of the process, as well as to put in place output metrics, as well as setting realistic targets in terms of uh, component processes. So how long should a, a, a particular referral sit in what each in a given part of its um, processing. Again, I've, 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 spoken on, I've spoken about the importance of this culture of continuous improvement through problem solving and systems thinking. And I think this is where this project has a, a bigger dimension in relation to building a capable state. Um, shifting from a, a kind of very much a sort of compliance reporting uh, culture, which is quite risk averse, to a culture of uh, continuous improvement. Here, this slide sets out our best understanding of the um, current value chain uh, across the entire system. Um, I won't go into it in, in detail, but the committee has, has sight of this. And this just maps out how uh, from, uh, from the issuing of a proclamation, um, which is a process between um, the presidency and the Department of Justice and, and the SIU um, to investigation, to, to the tabling of reports, uh, to the referrals, to specific uh, uh, um, departments or agencies, depending on what types of referrals um, and, and how, the, the, how a particular recommendation would move through this, this uh, uh, process from uh, being identified through an investigation based on a proclamation through all of the different component parts. So this just gives an illustration. Again, this is obviously a work in progress because as we discover more, so we, we adjust our map of this ecosystem. I'll then now move to um, some more detailed uh, 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 diving into the component parts of this ecosystem. Um, and, and, and this is where, you, uh, you know, the devil is in the detail. Um, and, and as you get to the very, very uh, uh, mechanical level, so you start to see where you can really uh, uh, make uh, interventions to move the dial on, on this. Um, so here, for example, is a, um, a, a, a map, a, a, a process map of the issuing of proclamations um, uh, with the Department of Justice, the Presidency, and the SIU. And here we map in this, you can see, we include the kind of interfaces, the systems that are currently available, the store, data storage, the risks, and it's very, very detailed. Um, and here is where we can start to identify opportunities for deploying technology, uh, for putting in place standards where we might need to improve uh, human capacity, allocation of, of, of roles and responsibilities, and begin to be able to monitor and track the time that it should take from <clears throat> when, the, you know, uh, when the SIU requests a, 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 a proclamation and for, uh, to the point at which um, it, it, it is... is um, uh, issued as a proclamation, where reports return, how letters are communicated from, uh, from the presidency to the affected uh, departments, how the, those, that correspondence is stored, tracked, uh, etc. The next 
the next slide gives an insight into uh, the, uh, by way of example, the referrals to the uh, NPA around uh, criminal matters. And again, you have the different swim lanes with the SIU, the National Prosecuting Authority, and then, uh, in fact, uh, giving insight into the complexity of uh, any one of these given environments, the distinction between the National Prosecuting Authority's head office and regional offices. So each time one uh, moves into a space, a little bit like peeling an onion, uh, a new layer of complexity and opportunities for systems improvements reveal themselves. Um, you'll see uh, manual systems in place um, that, uh, you know, that, so that, that, that again contribute to, to uh, uh, perhaps uh, delays, but where one has to really recognize that the, the, the way systems work and not uh, disrupt things that are working with an uh, with a, a kind of over overly ambitious attempt to automate or impose a system. Um, I'll move to the next slide. This uh, here maps out uh, the, the the business process for administrative referrals, which could be popularly described as blacklisting of suppliers, and how um, these the process. Uh, 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 is initiated uh, by the SIU investigation, is then referred to um, either uh, uh, accounting officers um, with a, uh, who receive a recommendation. Uh, this particular um, uh, uh, business process refers with, uh, to the process where accounting officers are given the recommendations. Uh, as I'll discuss later, some of the recommendations for blacklisting go to regulatory authorities, such as Competition Commission or um, Construction Industry uh, a Board, etc. Um, so again, by, by, by way of illustration, I won't go into the details of this. Um, moving to the second dimension of this project, which is prototyping a monitoring and analytical capability. So uh, the team has been involved in this in-depth assessment of the data of, of both the data and the data systems in all the various departments and entities from SIU, DPSA, Treasury, uh, NPA, um, and really looking at, at uh, the, the state of data management, governance, um, and, and wrestling with what is uh, quite a complex uh, uh, um, environment. So we, we're really trying to understand the best, how best to utilize existing investments and opportunities in order to build a robust and credible monitoring system to track referrals across the different environments. The interface from when, one, when, it, when data leaves one environment into the next is quite complex because there are different units of measure. Um, one, one entity will be using an incident, uh, another will be using a, a case number, which might, might be a collection of incidents. So trying to find unique identifiers to track a particular um, uh, uh, referral across the system presents a number of, of challenges. But our, so the efforts will enable analysis across different data sets to understand where there are blockages as well as deficiencies in the data management system. So uh, also, you know, great opportunities have arisen of, of how to share expertise um, within the state system. For example, where we find um, pockets of excellence, you know, for example, within the fusion center, they have in-house capability through the FIC to do development. And th that can be shared through um, uh, arrangements across the ecosystem. So without having to outsource through um, you know, procurement processes, sharing expertise and building this culture, almost community of practice within the different, within the ecosystem. And so now what we'll show you now are um, our um, uh, uh, sort of dashboard mock-ups, uh, as well as the current level uh, of analysis that the team has been able to produce, focusing on the three categories that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and, and the, we've chosen those categories because they require the most, the, the highest level of coordination across the, the multiple uh, agencies. And these are uh, disciplinary action, um, administrative referrals and criminal referrals. 
So this um, this dashboard prototype, um, we've 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 found that um, you know we've been looking at which technologies are common across different uh, um, uh, de uh, uh, departments and agencies, and seeing how best to leverage th th those. And and here's just a mock-up of 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 how we could be tracking um, the, the the status of proclamations. So looking at um, how long are proclamations being um, are, are taken to to move through various stages, um, and then other indicators of um, uh, in, uh, indicators, for example, of, of allegations received by the SIU that are being recorded uh, in an electronic uh, system, percentage of allegations assessed by a assessment committee. So, in a sense, this. And this is just purely a mock-up. It's a, it's a, it's it's not something that is currently um, uh, uh, being used. But it's just our 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 experimental approach to say how would we be tracking efficiency, for example, within the SIU environment. And we have a number of different mock-ups, which I won't show here. That will that will create um, uh, performance indicators and metrics across the different uh, component parts. So here, these figures presented here are just for illustration. They're not actual, but just to get a sense of uh, uh, what this uh, system will, will produce uh, uh, eventually. And, 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 and uh, much of this, or, 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 uh, as appropriate, can be public facing. Um, uh, committees such as SCOPA can access uh, uh, information without having to call for it. Um, uh, 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 you know, once we have credible, robust, secure, um, uh, uh, auditable data processes in the back end, you know, the, 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 the GIGO uh, principle, the garbage in, garbage out, is, is, is very much a, a, a factor that needs to be kept front of mind. Um, so now I'll just move now to each of these three dimensions that we've been looking at. Um, so give an overview of the discoveries and um, uh, insights and progress around, for example, the disciplinary referrals. These are referrals by the, uh, from the SIU to accounting offices where they found uh, cause for, 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 for disciplinary action to be taken against officials. So we note low levels of compliance by departments um, on updating the status of disciplinary cases on the Purcell system. It's the personnel and salary system that is a kind of bedrock system of, of the public service, uh, uh, national and provincial, which is administered by DPSA. Um, now, the, the Purcell system has uh, a, a, a fields to record the status of disciplinary processes, but uh, these are not uh, routinely updated. Potentially, as we identify uh, you know, a very valuable source of data for tracking progress on SIE referrals using the Purcell system. However, the compliance, uh, uh, the low levels of compliance, and that, that is a function of the fact that the labor relations officials in, in departments are responsible for disciplinary, but the Purcell uh, system is administered generally in a different part, uh, uh, the sort of fi finance side of uh, the salary side of a given department. So they are there's, a, there's a, an, an inner inability to, for, for the disciplinary, the, the labor relations officials to, to access that system. So there's a lot of um, uh, reforms that are needed in order to make this work, but we've identified this as a, as, a, as a good opportunity. Similarly, DPSA reports low levels of compliance on their quarterly foresaid reporting uh, system around disciplinary cases. So overall, the quality and, of, and compliance around uh, reporting on disciplinary cases is low. Um, also within DPSA, uh, also currently DPSA is using a manual system for tracking disciplinary cases, re receiving quarterly reports from, from departments. So one of the areas that we are, put, uh, are, are, are advocating for is starting to use ICT technology. In, very simply, uh, Excel spreadsheets, etc., cetera, um, with, uh, towards creating uh, um, a better system for tracking. We've taken the subset of the PPE disciplinary cases 
um, uh, and, and we've used those as a test case to look at them against Purcell. For example, what we've discovered is um, uh, the four Public Service uh, Act officials that have resigned uh, in that data set, um, we've looked at th those ID numbers and seen that, that those officials, although Purcell records that they've resigned, it does not record um, a category which is on Purcell, which says resigned pending departmental, uh, apologies for the typo, departmental or criminal charges. It, it, it records designed, uh, resigned, either just resigned or resigned for, for new work opportunities. And what becomes very important is that Purcell must record, if you resigned in order to avoid um, a disciplinary process, any future employer should be able to access that information on Purcell and have a red flag and certainly ask you to account for that. Um, so the progress we've made is uh, making connections between SIU and DPSA. Uh, the, the process uh, had been for SIU to make referrals to the relevant accounting officer, but DPSA has a legal uh, mandate under the Palmer Act to oversee and track uh, disciplinary. So this process has created that connection between SIU and DPSA. Um, and with DPSA playing now, uh, uh, playing, starting to play a role within the SIU referrals process. We've also done data cleansing on the PPE referrals and doing cross-checking against Purcell. Uh, DPSA has embarked on a, a follow-up correspondence to all national and provincial departments affected by referrals from the PPE report in line with section 50 of, of the Palmer Act. Uh, and this correspondence has also included instructions to the accounting officers to update and track um, these cases on the Purcell system. So now we are able to look at Purcell and see the levels of compliance and then follow up. Um, and the process of, of establishing standard operating procedures for handling SIU disciplinary referrals has been initiated. Um, so the next steps that we look, we're currently working on is to develop uh, DPSA is looking at developing measures for consequence management for non-compliance on reporting on disciplinary cases. Um, uh, so uh, where there are letters from the DG of DPSA and there's non-compliance from, the, um, from the accounting officer, that then can become a disciplinary matter that can be taken up within presidency. Um, uh, also working with the labor relations officials in different departments on how they can uh, interface with the Purcell system. Um, we're formalizing the, the, the mechanism for SIU referrals when SIU makes a referral for disciplinary cases that uh, DPSA is automatically included at the, at the get-go. We also need to be, uh, the, 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 the local government space is, is, a, is, 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 we have not yet ventured into that, and that's one of the key uh, areas that we'll be moving into soon. Similarly, public entities, although we have begun engaging in that space through um, DPE. So here's some analysis of the data. Uh, initially, we'll just talk to the data set from SIU of the 2021-2022 financial year. That's the most recent one. There have been 463 referrals for disciplinary actions arising from SIU investigations. This um, slide just shows that uh, where the provinces, um, you know, in terms of highest to lowest, with uh, KwaZulu-Natal having received the highest number of referrals, uh, 202, followed by Gauteng, Eastern Cape at number three, Limpopo, um, 53. Um, and this is um, obviously indicative of where the investigations are focused, but this is a very rudimentary piece of analysis, um, but it does begin to allow to think different, to think about, okay, what are the next steps in terms of engaging provincial governments, et cetera. Um, Entity types, we can see that national departments have the highest number of disciplinary referrals at 173, followed by public entities, then uh, municipalities, and finally, uh, uh, provincial governments. Um, here, we begin to see the value of this kind of analysis. Institutions with the highest number of disciplinary referrals, so SASA uh, is the highest number, Department of Education, that's the National Department at 58, Department of Health, then Etiquini Metropolitan Municipality at number four. Um, 
the essay and the effort um, number five on Gany Water at um, uh, number six. And, and again, these are for the data set 2021, 2022. Um, and again, you know, thinking through in terms of the broader context, we're dealing with, for example, um, uh, uh, with uh, disaster management, uh, disaster in the Etiquini Metropolitan Municipality. You want officials with high levels of uh, integrity and 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 um, uh, ethical behavior. So it's important that that these disciplinary processes, where people have been implicated in wrongdoing, that these processes are, are brought to rapid conclusion to ensure that, for example, the processes around uh, implementing disaster management are, are in the hands of, of, of ethical people. Now we move to this particular subset that we've done a deeper dive. This is, these relate to the, let's call them PPE referrals. And so these are for, for two financial years under Proclamation 23 of 2020. So they are, 176 individuals um, where referrals have been made. Um, and we've been doing some deep dives around this. And here's some more data. Um, so we've, uh, out of the 176, 51 of these matters have been finalized. Um, th that, that figure could be higher. We have yet to engage with some of the, uh, um, uh, get more updated um, information um, so, uh, from the from local government and some of the public entities, but uh, 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 fifty one of them, uh, twenty nine percent have been finalised, and of of these twenty nine, um, uh, of these fifty one, sorry, of the fifty one matters that have been finalised, twenty nine. Have resulted in guilty findings, which is a 57% uh, guilty rate, and then and then nine officials resigned before the disciplinary processes, uh, before during uh, the disciplinary processes, or before sanctions could be handed down. Now that's that's also an area which we're looking into more uh, at more deeply. One of these their processes underway to freeze um, salaries, um, but again. Um, it's important that if an if a if a, a an official resigns in order to avoid sanction, that that needs to be uh, recorded on PASOL. Then there's a breakdown of those that have um, of the finalized. So 29 guilty, nine not guilty, three uh, no grounds for charges, case dismissed, nine resigned, and one person deceased. Um, and then a breakdown of the sanctions for the guilty findings. Five people have been dismissed, three suspended without pay, 12 issued with final written warnings, seven issued with written warnings, um, corrective counseling uh, for one, and in one instance, which was an intern, their contract was not renewed. Um, so now we move to another category on the administrative referrals, the findings from initial engagements, so the SIU makes recommendations to accounting officers as well as regulatory and professional bodies for sanctions such as blacklisting of suppliers implicating in, in malfeasance. Um, so so the, what, it's up to the accounting officer uh, to then uh, go through a process um, approaching the supplier, uh, asking them for reasons why they should not be blacklisted. And then based on that process, the accounting officer must then make recommendations to National Treasury's Chief Procurement Officer for inclusion on the restricted supplier database. Um, so it's a it's not a direct link between SIU and um, the Chief Procurement uh, and National Treasury. However, what is very useful is we have two data sets: one the referrals and one the restricted data supply. So it's 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 a it's, we've got a great way of measuring. Um, uh, the if, if, if efficiency and effectiveness of this referral system, um, and we've and I'll show you the analysis that we've done. So we've done a series of engagements. We've established a, a working group that meets uh, regularly every two weeks, uh, which is I think a very effective uh, uh, component of this process so far. Identifying, um, looking at the specifics, uh, and and identifying various interventions that can improve 
the consequence management space from things like including um, new uh, looking at including new uh, clauses in the general uh, conditions of contract around um, uh, blacklisting uh, or the restricted suppliers and and various other forms of analysis um, uh, which I'll show which we'll show now um, you know analyzing the whether which uh, su suppliers uh, for referred uh, for blacklisting by uh, SIU have in fact uh, uh, landed up on the suppliers restricted suppliers database. We are engaging with departments and entities, both as presidency and also as national treasury, to say, where are you with these referrals, uh, uh, correspondence going out? And then also some, some new ideas that have emerged to use the BAS, the basic accounting system, to start to, to, to stress test the treasury's restricted supply register. Some interesting findings have arisen there uh, with actions um, to, to tighten up things there. So in terms of our next steps um, in this space, we, we really, we, we've got a number of interventions um, that we are collectively pushing SIU, uh, National Treasury and the presidency team to increase the, uh, to move the dial on, 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 on compliance um, for blacklisting. Um, uh, but, you know, not to say that, uh, that uh, the, you know, not, 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 not not to second guess the due process of, of accounting officers in relation to, 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 to suppliers, but making sure that it's visible and they're accountable. Um, and we move to the next slide. So here's some analysis around this uh, administrative referrals. This looks at the, um, the data set for the uh, most recent two financial years. SIU has been, uh, um, this the referrals for administrative uh, uh, action uh, have been a performance uh, um, measure for the past two years. So they've got very good data on this. So there've been a total of 41,187 referrals uh, in the 2020-21 year and 24,782 referrals for 21-22. Um, and so the combined for, for, for the two years is 65,996 referrals. However, the vast majority of these referrals relate to removal of deceased persons from the Enatus database. And there's quite an interesting um, backstory on how um, the SIU have identified um, a, a, a kind of a scam that utilizes the transferring of um, money owed uh, to deceased people uh, to deceased ID numbers on um, on the uh, on the eNatus database, thus allowing a kind of cleansing and allowing um, uh, 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 people to avoid paying what can be very high costs in terms of of, of licenses, etc. Uh, particularly in the trucking industry, so uh, SIU has been engaging with eNatus and um, and removing these uh, the 41,000 in the 2020 um, year have been have been dealt with and the, the 24,000 are in the process of being dealt with so that leaves us with 650 referrals for administrative action outside of that um, and you can see there the breakdown that we have is a total of 353 have been referred to accounting offices uh, with a recommendation for blacklisting a supplier or an individual um, and uh, 295 to regulatory bodies to determine sanction um, uh, in relation to their own internal processes as well as to refer to national treasuries. There are a, a few where um, there are two where the executive authority has been uh, uh, the recipient of, 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 um, of the referral. Um, let me go to the next slide. Here's a more detailed breakdown um, for the 2020 and 2021, 2022 um, administrative referrals. So in 2021, 22, ESCOM has the greatest number, 99 referrals, then Transnet, then the Media and Information Communication Technology CETA, um, 35, then Gauteng Department of Health, uh, Elias Motswaledi Municipality, 
And if we look at the top five for 2021, 22, Free State Provincial Treasury has the, the greatest number. These are from the PPE referrals. Then Omgani Water Board, uh, a different pro proclamation, uh, National Department of Transport, KZN and the pro Department of pro Transport. So, um, and you can also see um, uh, below uh, uh, their referrals to executive authorities, just two, um, one to the MEC of Health, uh, uh, in Eastern Cape and the MEC uh, of Health in Gauteng, those relate to HODs, um, and then the regulatory authorities below, so, uh, South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, Competition Commission, uh, CIDB, um, the Construction Industry Development Board, Housing Development Agency, Engineering Council, and then one to the Johannesburg Council of, um, of Advocates. But when one sees, you know, the, you, you, we, we are focusing on where there are high numbers. So uh, Department of Public Enterprises is, is, um, uh, is following up with ESCOM and Transnet, um, uh, as well as National Treasury. They have a standing um, uh, engagements with, with the parastatals. And so this uh, matter has been put uh, high on the agenda. Um, uh, follow-ups are being done with all of we can we can deal with a lot of numbers by dealing with a relatively few number of of uh, of uh, institutions and asking them you know how you know why no progress so when we look at for example um so here's the, here's the full list so you can see the top five account for the vast majority of of um or top six uh, of referrals um <clears throat> Now we did the we did an analysis against the national treasury's restricted suppliers, and of this 365, sorry, 353 referrals from SIU, only 16 of those suppliers appear on the restricted suppliers um, register, national treasury, and all of those 16 are from uh, referrals made to the media information communication uh, technology CETA. Um, so it really creates a, a kind of space of how we're going to, how we then work, you know, approaching all of the other accounting offices and requesting um, uh, 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 information as to, as to how those processes are proceeding. Um, and, and I mentioned this task team um, to, to, to move the dial. Um, and I think we've covered the last uh, uh, points already. Um, let me move to progress on criminal referrals. These are uh, SI, SIU refers matters to the NPA. Um, so the findings from our initial engagements is, as I mentioned, that the struggle for unique common, uh, common unique identifiers between the data sets, uh, make uh, up, uh, updating an analysis uh, of a baseline uh, challenging currently. So we, the, the, the analysis we present here is, is very high level. Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to align these. Uh, work is being done in that space. Um, and we are engaging with the Fusion Center and with uh, 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 NPA, DPCI, and SIU around this, uh, without wanting to interfere in their own, in, you know, their own processes, is providing support where we can. Um, there's uh, uh, internal deliberations within the, the justice, criminal justice space around how the investigations, at what point should the DPCI be brought on board? Um, and uh, at the moment, uh, there are no sort of systems in place for sharing progress information between NPA and SIU. Uh, currently, uh, it's follow-ups by SIU investigators, but that has, in fact, uh, that is an evolving space. So there is now a register of um, of SIU cases, and, and this is evolving. Um, there is an MOU under development between the SIU, NPA, and DPCI. Um, we, we've had an initial meeting convened by presidency um, to bring the parties together uh, to discuss the modalities of how uh, criminal referrals will be handled. Um, and that should be coming to, uh, we should have that in place. Um, uh, uh, certainly a final draft for consideration by the principals is we're aiming to have that by the end of the month. Um, 
also at creating connections between the data, the data teams at NPA and SIU. Um, our efforts to analyze the different data sets have re revealed gaps and inconsistencies, so opportunities to improve there. Um, and uh, our engagements with the Fusion Center case management system really has, has, has given us uh, this, the sense that there's a real opportunity, there's capacity within the Fusion Center, um, and, and how do we scale that capacity uh, across the system? So we're going to, we, we, you know, as mentioned, we're supporting this MOU, um, this bus the business process mapping. Uh, how do we, looking at opportunities to link uh, NPA and data systems. Our team, this project team of DPME presidency has got some, we've brought on board some very good um, technical capabilities um, in terms of analytic, analytics, in terms of business process mapping and design, as well as um, developer uh, capacity. So, so we're able to do this kind of proto pro uh, prototyping. Um, we still don't really feel confident around a baseline on, on, in this space, but we can show just very you know, high level analysis of where the criminal referrals are made, the numbers, there's 562. If we're looking at the most recent data set, um, and, uh, and we provide a breakdown across different provinces um, and institution types with provincial departments having the highest number of, of, of uh, criminal referrals followed by national, followed by municipalities. Um, by way of conclusion, Chairperson, um, this project to establish this coordination and monitoring mechanism is making good progress notwithstanding the complex implementation environment. And I think what has been very exciting and encouraging is the, the energy that is being unlocked through this approach, strong support and buy-in from all stakeholders. So we've, as mentioned, we've, we, we, we're conducting process mapping to understand the challenges and opportunities in the ecosystem. We're doing data analysis, uh, focusing initially on the most recent referrals and as we build capability, so we can move backwards into the, the, the legacy reports. Um, again, when we find challenges and impediments, the approach is to create a, a space and almost a permission to embark on problem solving, to unlock opportunities. Um, collaboration from all stakeholders is well established. Um, and, and, and this, this introduction of design thinking and problem solving, as opposed to a kind of compliance and reporting uh, uh, imperative is, 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 is showing good results. The challenges that we're confronting um, include uh, data inconsistencies, um, the alignment of data terms and, and, and standards, different terminology, different standards, data protocol sharing still needs to be established to ensure data quality. And this will be a major push um, uh, to create those interfaces, the APIs that will allow for seamless sharing of information. There's also, there are legacy and manual systems. The ecosystem is characterized by old and inadequate systems, making it difficult to collate and maintain uh, the data as well as shared data. And again, uh, the escalation mechanisms are, 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 are currently not in place to address lack of timely feedback and progress. So that's another important focus uh, for this effort. Uh, also, we know duplication of effort across the ecosystem, so streamlining. I think finally, Chair, um, this unfolding process has revealed really important entry points for building state capability and improving coordination around the implementation dimension of remedial actions and consequence management beyond the, 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 the SIU. And I, and I think what is emerging here is a, a momentum that will be applicable and valuable beyond just the SIU. Uh, that's the end of this um, presentation, Chairperson. I will hand back to the DDG and the Minister for the second part of this um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Th thank you, to Mr. Tim. What is the second part, Tim? The, the second part relates to the uh, disciplinary matter. 
we'll, we'll no no uh, okay no no before we get there or maybe let's go there it's fine let's go there who's doing that is it in or the gg yeah minister i would request that uh, we we go to that one and move with particular speed because we need to be mindful of time uh, given that uh, your presence is going to be restricted today because of the engagements that you have. So can uh, we move with maybe, the particular speed, yeah? Maybe to relieve the Honourable Chair, that engagement has been cancelled. Uncle Mtanda is our most. That engagement has been cancelled. Uh, okay. Let's check... Uh, I'm not sure if you want us to combine this or to deal with it, Kedo, because that one of legal it is a simple report of the state of the legal of the situation. Of no, the I think we to, let's take the progress report uh, that is suspended, DG, so that okay. we engage once members will be will, okay. will take the questions and, and, and channel them accordingly. And deal with everything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Bafuti, can you take us through all? All I can say, Chair. On that one, what I know, we are at a point where we are dealing uh, with uh, we we are dealing with uh, what I would refer to as uh, part A and B at the same time. Part A would have been involved a situation where. Uh, given an award in favor of the DG to come back to work. In other words, uh, get out of suspension is the area. And then part A, therefore, is when we applied that uh, that do not proceed for a number of reasons that we've articulated. So that constituted part A. And then part B would be dealing with the substance. Now, normally, these, these are done separately. But for this one, uh, both of them are being dealt with at the same time. We are dealing with the reason why the DG should stay, should stay as the essence, to st should stay suspended. And I think a particular date has been agreed for that purpose uh, where the judge will adjudicate. Bafudi, can you take us through? Thanks so much, Mr. and thanks, thanks so much, uh, my members of the com committee. Uh, as you said, uh, Minister, uh, with regard to the disciplinary processes, uh, members will recall that uh, in our last meeting to the SCOPA, uh, we have indicated uh, with regard to the process which has been undertaken. Where we are now, in short, uh, the member will, will remember that uh, Mr. Advocate Vukela uh, was challenging uh, his suspension. Uh, in the labor court, in the GCB. The GCB find in his favor to say he must be brought back to the office uh, so that he can be charged when he's in the office. But the minister is challenging the decision of the bargaining council, uh, taking into consideration the seriousness of the charges which has been leveled against uh, Advocate Fokela. Uh, we are now challenging the outcome of the bargaining council. The matter is has been set down on the 14th of June, where we will be uh, putting our case before uh, the Labour Court. I think, in short, uh, that's what we can say in terms of the update with regards to the bargaining council. But DDG Hatsi can also have something to add uh, on that issue. Thanks, ministers, and thanks, uh, the Thank chair. You. Thank, 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 thank you, Advocate Mbafudi. Uh, Tidiji, do you want to add anything? Well, it seems there's, there's, there's nothing more to be added. Just quickly, so that we can hand back to you, Chairperson, Honorable Chair. The attempt here, as I've said at the beginning, is to ensure uh, objectives uh, Jonathan, can you go back to Mr. Tim on the objectives of the project slide? Thank you very much. Uh, 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 objectives of the project slide. You got it and you left it. Uh, that's, that's yes, 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 yes. These are the objectives, honorable members. And the key one to me is that one of 
an attempt to create a networked database system that provides on demand access, access to the implementation status of any referral, irrespective of what category it falls under. And this process seeks to ensure that we establish a system that ensures mutually informed expectation between us, the executives and parliament. Of course, the concept explicit saying that this relationship that has been existing between these institutions led to definition of its purpose and its objectives. And then what we're trying to do now in looking at that value chain, we want to make sure that we've got a common understanding of the relationship between all those institutions, what should be expected from each institution. And of course, members would have heard that this process is assisting to expose a system, what we would refer to as systemic defect in the established state institution, e.g. personal has already uh, been explained. In other words, it exposes us to a number of windows, to the opportunities of strengthening the capacity of the state, also the opportunities uh, to also expose weaknesses that need to be corrected. Let's go to the categories of referrals. Uh, uh, that's my last point, uh, Honorable Chair. Categories of referrals, uh, Tim. Mr. Jonathan, let's go to the categories of referrals. Yes, Minister, apologies there. Thank you. In, in a nutshell, Honorable Chair, this is going to be the key indicator of whether this ecosystem, which we say once established, is going to outlive us in so that accountability don't depend on willing individuals or unwilling individuals, but depend on a system that will outlive all of us. But the indicators that are going to test whether everything we're doing to actually give efficiency to this relationship in a scientific or systemically organized manner is that these categories are going to be indicators how many things go to civil litigation, how many goes to criminal referrals, how many goes for disciplinary action, how many goes to administrative referrals, and what are we doing as the state with regard to systemic recommendations that are discovered by SIU? This is going to be the main key indicator of whether this thing, this whole story that Tim is explaining uh, actually is making sense uh, in the public eye, in parliament and everywhere else. Back to you, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Minister and your team uh, for that very comprehensive and the thorough um, unpacking of the issue of the referrals uh, as we had raised them. Um, before I say anything more, can I just hand over to Advocate in TV, the head of the SIU, if there's any additions and comments that he would like to make. make. Um, and then colleagues, please indicate uh, if you wish to uh, uh, speak, and then we will um, go into the interactive session. Head of unit, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chair, uh, and thanks uh, to the Honorable Members, uh, Honorable Minister, and my colleague, uh, Mr. Tim, for a very comprehensive, wonderful presentation. Honorable Chair, um, uh, as SIU, um, I mean, we've, we've really been part of the process uh, that's driven by the uh, presidency under the leadership of the minister. We are really delighted and happy to see this unfold uh, to this stage uh, where, where we have a system now uh, that will really help us monitor uh, the consequences and the referrals uh, of the of the SIU. Um, as my colleague indicates, you know this is really going to help us uh, and, and help government even beyond uh, the SIU work. It's such a it's such an ecosystem that will assist uh, in the building of the real capable state and ethical ethical state in the knowledge. Uh, our view, Honorable Chair, that we have said and we have said to the Honorable uh, Minister was that we have observed in action on the part of state institutions in implementing the recommendations that would ultimately result in consequence management. We're really happy to see this. Uh, just the one comment, um, 
but of course this we could make as part of the as part of the team uh, honorable chair you know that there's a phenomenon that uh, when when uh, officials are faced with disciplinary processes they resign and and you can see that the team has clearly identified that uh, so and i'm glad that uh, is going to be recorded on the on the parcel um, to uh, DPSA to consider a mechanism to monitor uh, those who resign uh, so that they don't uh, crop up or appear in other state institutions. And the one other observation could be, and I know that we are the team is going to interact with Copter. Um, at the last check. We, 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 we established that uh, the municipalities uh, do not use personal. Uh, we, may, we may be wrong in that regard, but that was the last check. And of course, even the, the monitoring of the SOE so that the, these resigned uh, officials don't, don't appear anywhere, anywhere in government, uh, uh, because we really want to, want to stop that. Uh, the other point, oh yeah, the other point I really just want to, to make, and, I, and again, it's really a point uh, uh, that, that we will make, and my, my colleague, Mr. Pranesh, is the, is the nodal point between us and the AGSA. Uh, so, so it will be very important also to interface this process with the AGSA, and, and, and the overall work of AGSA, where all of this work that the team is doing from the presidency could then inform uh, the audit plans and the improvement plans uh, that needs to be done. Lastly, Honorable Chair, and thanks for the opportunity really, is that we will also, I mean, engage with the team. And I think as, as, as uh, team indicates that this is evolving, uh, I'm sure it will evolve to a stage where we, we will include uh, the systemic recommendations. I know at the moment it's focusing on the three, but the inclusion of the systemic recommendations will be advised going forward, but that's part of the area which sees the improvements of the overall administration, uh, taking into account uh, the, the, the various other, uh, other initiatives of government, uh, an example really could be uh, the work that we have done in state-owned entities. Uh, the, so the systemic recommendations are recorded here and of course monitored and they could inform other, other governance structures like your uh, SOE council and so on. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really uh, just thinking widely as my colleague has said, this is the work that really becomes a blueprint and a benchmark uh, beyond beyond the SIU way. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Ntebi. I know that this is a long and difficult journey that um, SCOPA and the SIU have walked. Um, and I think arriving at this point uh, is, a, is a major, major breakthrough. Uh, because it's a matter that we have persistently raised that the reports have to come full circle with recommendations implemented and successful consequence management um, and ensuring that there are successful prosecutions. And I think that the closing of loopholes in the system will be very, very important as well. Um, so I think um, it's a good work so far, as complex as it is, but I think that it's the right step in the right direction uh, because the right step in itself is always important. Um, so I, I, I think you know, about Vusben um, Yamazan, we, we, we are seeing progress uh, in that regard. All right, let me um, go to Honorable Somio. Honorable Chair. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, the, the the minister and his uh, and his team colleagues, um, in in echoing uh, what you have just said, in appreciation of the development of the accountability frame, 
uh, on the finalized um, uh, scope of referrals to various uh, entities and substantive nature uh, of such referrals. Um, and, and therefore, the, the question of uh, follow through uh, of what uh, um, has to happen out of those. Um, I, 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 I think it's a, a, a progress that we need to uh, note uh, in that regard. Um, looking into uh, the broader scope uh, of uh, uh, platforms involved uh, in terms of the SIU work, and, and therefore the presidency's uh, actual uh, follow through uh, on those uh, uh, finalized uh, instances. Uh, just, just to enhance value for money, uh, the missing link uh, on the uh, five, the, in the context of the five itemized areas, uh, is, is a, uh, let's take an example of uh, disciplinary referrals. Uh, which uh, uh, speaks to uh, the uh, DPSA and and uh, looking into the area later on, uh, which has as well uh, been dealt with in terms of the reports. If you look into the integratedness um, of systems in government generally. It exposes uh, that lack, uh, if you would want to talk about uh, the relationship uh, between national, province, and local government. Uh, I appreciate that within the uh, national space, um, there's been found some form of integration looking into uh, government entities, uh, state-owned enterprises, and uh, all these other uh, related uh, institutions. Uh, something which therefore uh, lacks in looking into and chasing these other uh, spheres of government uh, on an uh, integrated form uh, of these uh, matters. What has a uh, moved us initially was uh, specifically in that, in that instance. We would find out that uh, SIU would make uh, referrals recommendations uh, to either uh, re relating to departments at the provincial level and, and uh, offices of the premiers who would uh, fail to uh, take responsible uh, measures in as far as such referrals are concerned. Um, there are some pertinent examples which were uh, somewhat glaring uh, at the time. And, 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 and therefore, the absence uh, of an intertwined system uh, in terms of your ecosystem uh, 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 minister uh, is, is worrisome. In that, in that, in that instance, um, and, and, and though one appreciates uh, this piece of work uh, as the indicative of progress uh, on the areas of accountability, in as far as the SIU referrals are concerned, so a lot of work uh, needs to go down through how you would uh, as well make uh, local government and provinces accountable for such a kind of referrals because the signing authority in terms of those uh, 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 actual directives uh, to SIU for investigations are a responsibility uh, of the presidency, specifically the president, uh, in a way looking into whether it will come from local government, will come from the province. So, so we need that kind of assurance that those are not going to be lost, uh, uh, you see, uh, while we follow those which are at the national level. Otherwise, I, I appreciate uh, the 
the actual setup, the framework, the commitment, uh, and as well the coordination of those who are involved in terms of uh, uh, realizing uh, the actual scope of work which has been done for value proposition um, of what has been uh, the input uh, to finalize such investigations. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Sonu. Honorable Menton, then we'll get responses and take another round of questions. Thank you very much, Chairperson uh, Asbonge, and good morning to colleagues. Now, Chairperson, I just have two areas of concern. One, um, from the objectives of this particular system, which is being um, established from scratch. I uh, just want to check in terms of centrality. Is it going to be built in such a way that there is a monitoring um, tool from presidency that will alert them every time a disciplinary hearing is finalized from any department and captured? So as soon as it's being captured, will they be able to see it? Will they be able to account for that and also account to the SIU in terms of progress? And if it's not so, we are going to face a danger because as I was listening to the explanation of how PESAL is dealt with, it shows that um, PESAL is only dealt with from the finance department, which to my experience in the government sector, that shouldn't be the case from uh, human resource department is the one that uploads disciplinary hearings and uploads any other information uh, with regards to employees of government. But then I'm not sure what's happening right now, and I'm not comfortable with the fact that there is such a shortfall with the system. And if that's the case, it means that only finance could be able to upload anything or stop a salary and everything else, then uh, human resources is not going to be able to be dealing with the matters of um, disciplinary hearings. But I heard that the system is being corrected and enhanced so that everyone else can have access to it. But at the very same time, access to such a sensitive system has to be limited in some ways because it can easily be manipulated. But then we need that kind of a comfort in terms of um, the technical know-how of the system and the centrality thereof in terms of monitoring. Then number two, the DG will get. I'm really not comfortable with the explanation and the processes thereof that have been undertaken in ensuring that the DG is being held accountable properly. I feel like there is a lack of investigation from the people who were representing the state, if I may say so, against him in stating the facts. Because there is so many things that we dealt with from the funeral of Mama Winnie, the, uh, there was another funeral we dealt with where he was heavily implicated. And then to the matter of Bait Bridge. But to be told that it's an, unfair, it's an unfair suspension and therefore we don't have a case. To me, that shows that there is a problem within the state itself. It cannot have people who go and investigate and consolidate the facts to go and represent the state in order to cleanse itself of any unquestionable uh, uh, questionable characters. So I'm not comfortable, Minister. We need more information as to what was being done because there is no paying attention to detail as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Ment. Uh, Babusomo, please mute. Oh, the co-host, can they mute you, Babusomo? Right, let's get responses to that first set of uh, questions, and then we will 
proceed. Imam Talasha, you will be the first one in the next round. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, Tim, can you take us to slide 24 of your presentation? Slide 24. Thank you very much. Just keep it there. Let me first thank Honorable Chair the, the response by the members. I'll try to, clear, to answer some few issues and I'll ask the technical guys to, to reinforce me if I actually mess up anything. Let me thank you, Honorable Chair, and the members who have spoken so far in welcoming the attempt, which we have set up front that is a, it's a journey which is not perfect at this moment. As we move along, we will be learning in getting it better, but we're comfortable in your, just exactly like in your words, Chair, that the, the step and the path and the direction is correct. The reason I'm going to slide 24, I want to respond to Honorable Somio, just to say it's only local government where the link is what to call, it has to be corrected, and I think Mr. Stiem accepted that omission, but we must also appreciate that Honorable Member Somio stated that point again so that it's not only us who are handling it. And we will thank him. I just want to show that slide to show that a lot of information to that far goes as far as the detailed situation of provinces. Only thing that is not there is local government. Uh, the other issue is. I, I hope this will be answered by Tim himself. Where I'm sitting on a moment, uh, I think you're asking a question. Uh, if you can go to slides on objectives, uh, Tim. Uh, I forgot that this slide number what? It's okay. I think, but Jonathan uh, Tim will explain it better when he comes in. My understanding, Honorable Mentor, when we say this is an attempt uh, mapping the process, looking at the value chain, giving it explicit nature, but that objective at the beginning, the, the first one that says, a networked database system that provide on-demand access to the, implement, to the implementation status of a referral made by this one seeks to allay your what to call because once the system, once the ecosystem is seamless in nature, it means there's a single window to look at everything, whether issue is before is after proclamation, whether the findings have been have gone to whatever referral, but the status of the implementation will always be exposed in the system, so that. If we have a duty to act as presidency, there is no basis for not doing so because that single window will actually show us that. But uh, I think uh, the team will explain it better than I do. But I think that addresses the fear of uh, honorable mentor. And then also, I, I guess the question of the abuse of the system will take note of that honorable mentor. Uh, we will we'll have to do everything to avoid it being abused. On the Vogel, I, 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 this is my last comment as a minister. Mbafud uh, will explain this, but my understanding of the reason we are appealing against the, the award. One of the reasons, if I remember very well, but Mbafud will explain this, was that it was not the information and the findings of the investigation to which they based, to which the arbitrator based his, uh, his award. It was more about procedural matters. And uh, it was about, it has been too long too, that um, the chairperson was supposed to, the chairperson had no basis not to proceed with the, with the DC. And all those kind of, they are more procedural than the weight. And the reason not appealing is exactly those, uh, those facts that you are raising, that on the basis of those facts, there can be no basis, in other words, on substance. So that was also a sort of procedure. And I think we're also challenging that procedure. But I'll ask uh, Jonathan to talk on 
technical issues if I've left anything, uh, Tim? Thank you, Minister. Um, no, I, I think I don't have a great deal to add at this point. Um, the, 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 the concerns raised by Honorable Mente are, um, are, are, are important in the sense that um, the, the quality of the systems at, uh, uh, and processes at any point of the system you know, will, will affect the overall integrity of the system. But the approach that we are following is to, you know, many eyes make the streets safe. Uh, so in a sense, if, if I can give an example of um, how we worked with the, with the administrative referrals, we have an endpoint of the system uh, of, of administrative referrals, which is the, the National Treasury's Restricted Supplier Database. We can test the reliability and um, integrity of that system by looking at whether companies that appear on the restricted supplier database are receiving payment from government by looking at the basic accounting system. So by 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 tying up by connecting multiple systems, you build the integrity and resilience of the overall system. So it's it's so it's it's that kind of approach that starts to create the checks and balances um, and resilience of the system. A little bit the way the internet that never collapses because it's distributed over thousands and thousands of servers across the world. So. It's it's a it's it's a it's a it's a uh, the example again of 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 the of the shortcomings in terms of the administration of the Purcell system um, are, are, are very useful um, insights into how to strengthen the system. So that's why this problem problem driven approach is so important. When we recognise that the reason why. Um, disciplinary matters are not recorded on the Purcell system is an organizational design um, uh, a problem in the sense that we imagine that the officials, the, 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 the administrators, the clerks that are responsible for, for uh, disciplinary processes may not have access to a computer that can allow them to update. They may not have the instruction from their superiors to do that. So those are all interventions that then need to have little uh, interventions put in place. And I can say, for example, that uh, DPSA is looking at issuing instructions to um, labor relations uh, officials to update these fields that do already exist on the system. It's just that the processes are not in place. Similarly, they are going to, they are working with or going to be working with labor relations officials to understand the constraints in terms of the, the way the, the Purcell system is configured. So it's very much this iterative um, problem solving approach that is going to build the resilience um, and robustness. Uh, an, another example, going back to the, the, the restricted supplies database, National Treasury, as a result of our deliberations, our brainstorming, decided to check their own um, restricted supply uh, um, a, a, a list uh, against the basic accounting system and discovered that some of the restricted suppliers who appear on the list have been paid, but by other departments, not the departments that resulted in the restriction. Now, further investigation is in place now to, to say, okay, was that payment on the basis of contracts that were entered into before a supplier was restricted? And if so, then there's no legal basis to restrict them because the, uh, because the contract is valid, which then again gives rise to the need for possibly looking at a reform of the general conditions of, of contract, which then needs an insertion of a, of, of, of a clause in the standard contract that says, if at any point as a supplier you are placed on the restricted supplier list, this contract will become invalid. So it's again iterative, adaptive, constantly fault finding and, and strengthening the system. 
from a technical, from a process, from a person point of view. So it's a, it's a journey um, that will result in an increasingly robust, resilient, adaptive system, um, which will use technology where appropriate, which will use uh, 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 people processes as appropriate to achieve the, the end result. I hope that is a, 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 an intelligible and useful response, Minister. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I was muted. Thank you very much uh, for the phenomenon of resilient and the uh, adaptive system, uh, Tim. Uh, Advocate Mpapuji. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, as you said, Minister, in terms of the issues there is because normally we are constrained maybe because the matters before the Labour Court in terms of what we can say before the committee, because whatever we might say yeah, can also be taken against us. Uh, but as you said, quite correctly, so the issue was not about the merit of the matter at the beginning concert. It was the issue to say, you know, it has been taken so much long in terms of the suspension. Uh, 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 that's why they find against us, but it was not on the merit. But I think it's good now, the matter is gonna be before the labor court on the 14th, and I think all these legal issues are going to be ventilated there. I think that's how far we can go for now. Thanks, Minister. Thank you, Honorable Mpawut. I went too much. I was not supposed to even myself. Uh, Honorable Boucher, back to you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Mom Tolasha. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Good day to you, colleagues, and the Honorable Minister, uh, Advocate McTibi, and the team. Good morning. Chair, let me start by appreciating the report. It is highly technical indeed. However, it does assist us in really realizing what we have always been talking about, the rooting out of corruption within the state. Chair, I think now we are not only talking, I think I'm impressed. There are systems in place now that can really make sure that this sketch is being dealt with. Chair, I want to applaud the minister and, and, and everybody who has made it possible for us to be where we are today. However, Chair, I hope minister and the team understands that we are dealing with a moving target here. So anything that they do, uh, the other side is moving faster and forever they are ahead of all of us. And as such, I'm not sure how I can put it, but there need to be a lot of agility here. I'm raising this chair because I'm also worried about the fact that the local government has not been part of this. And if we would listen to the AG's report, uh, the AG is overwhelmed. The treasurer seems also to be uh, overwhelmed with the corruption that is taking place in the local government sphere. I wish Chair to suggest that the minister should make a way that local government should be quickly brought in bo on board because whatever happens in the national government, remember those people that you might have dealt with decisively can also get to that sphere of government. And all those culprits that you might have eliminated in the national government, those can also go to local government. The local government is really vulnerable, Chairperson. I really would want to, to emphasize this, to say the good work that I'm impressed with should really be extended to, to local government. In local government, you see, just as, a, as an example, the CFO will be charged in this municipality. As Advocate Mutimbe said, he will resign immediately, jump to another municipality. By the time you realize the same person 
who resigned because he was to be charged or already charged. Now you see the person in another municipality and it becomes a business as usual. So the work that is being done by your service minister can be undermined for as long as we don't bring the local government on board. Chair, I also want to suggest that there should be a way that we must link up with, whilst we can have, we do have personal with all the government employees. I'm not sure how, but there should be a way of bringing even the local government officials to that kind of, 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 of a situation so that we are able to deal with all the shenanigans because they are. On the Mr. Vukela case, Chair, I, I don't want to say a lot, but I would want to hear more. Well, what did we learn out of this? Because for all our sins and weaknesses, Chair, we, we know we've been going through what Mr. Vukela has been alleged to have done without pronouncing ourselves. I really would want to hear on what did we learn because the kind of work that we, have do, we are doing and the systems that you are putting in place, there's going to be a lot of those uh, situations of head of departments and all important officials in the system might have to be charged one way or the other. So if we are coming back and from with Mr. Vukela's case, how, uh, what are we learning so that the work and the systems that we have put in place now can start to bear fruit going forward in making sure that the systems are beginning to bite within. It will be a good thing if we can celebrate one teacher's head, honorable minister. I think we will be able to say, yes, we are dealing with, with corruption. So chair, I want to welcome the report and really say it is clear, it, is, it, it, it sounds very efficient, and we hope to see results very soon, but it should go beyond this so that you can root out corruption in all three spheres of government. And in the process of embarking on, the, on other work, on making people to account, we must have learned some lessons and use those lessons going forward. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Dolasha. Um, all right, let's get the responses to that, and I think we can then bring this into a close. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Maybe before I proceed, DG Matietzi wanted to say something. Uh, DG? Um, th 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 thank you, uh, uh, Minister, uh, and thank, thank you to honourable members uh, for uh, the appreciating the, the work, and we will indeed, uh, yes, Jonathan indicated that this is a work in progress, uh, take these inputs when we strengthen our report and our, our processes. Um, but I felt also, Minister and Chair, honourable Mente, when she was talking to the issue of PESAL, she's correct indeed that um, because it is a system that is embedded within um, HR, so it is not a finance system, but our experience uh, is that, and this exercise is also showing that, that you know, the environments that have been able to automate their systems, to automate their um, HR systems and automate their finance systems, you see a seamless relationship uh, with, 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 with those. So it is, this is the same thing that we want to do. We want to ensure that we bring in technology uh, so that we can build this seamless relationship with all these different sections so that finance does not operate in silo, human resource does not operate in silo as, as well. So that, that point is very profound. And I think uh, my colleague Jonathan did talk to that, that as we enhance the system already, the views that are given to DPSA, they also talk, uh, talk, to, talk to that. Um, but also she raised the point around the limited access to, sen uh, to sensitive, uh, given the sensitivity of the issues. It is a, a good point, and when we do our risk assessment, we will bring this issue in uh, because we 
know that uh, there's matters of cyber security that needs to be dealt with. So we'll build in as part of our risk uh, management um, the, the, the the issue of limited access. And but the idea is that I, you need to be able to plug an ID of an official into the system, and then it just tracks the movement of of that official through the entire public service by just plugging in an, an, an ID number. And we, we know that uh, that is indeed uh, uh, possible. Um, and we believe also that it's going to assist in that um, issue that Advocate Mutig was talking to uh, of where you, you find that there's a risk of the, uh, the revolving doors. Uh, those were just the inputs from the side minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DDG. Uh... I, I, I guess, uh, Honorable Chair, all what you are saying is that uh, maybe just to remind ourselves that uh, one old man who is no longer with us, our former president Nelson Mandela would have said, you climb one mountain and realize that there are many more to climb. Uh, and I think that is what we're getting exposed to. We climb this mountain, as we climb it, we see many more to climb. And our commitment is to climb all of them. And having said that, uh, uh, I took a risk of getting excited on the Vugela issue and end up dealing with issues that should only be dealt with in court because there's always that vulnerability when you deal with the matter which is in the process of litigation. But if there are any lessons, I'll ask uh, um, Papudi to come in and tell us what lessons they have learned, and he knows how to navigate. Without get without descending in the arena, what, what I can say to Honorable Flash is that I have been fully briefed about this matter of Mr. Vugela, with my little uh, understanding of the process. I think I have not been disappointed by the work done so far. Uh, again, I want to say, you say, uh, Honorable Tulashe, the issue of local government is urgent, and I think I agree with you, it is urgent uh, to find a way, and I think Tim may want to say something about that for the last time. Uh, but let's stay with, let's ask us still in the uh, advocate in Paputi first. Any lessons learned on, on Vugela? Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Minister. You know, uh, without maybe uh, going beyond the boundaries, you know, I, I can say uh, in terms of what we are learning, I mean, we are all learning. I mean, we are living in the constitutional democracy okay. where, you know, everybody can challenge whatever decision which they want to challenge uh, in terms of what has been provided by the constitution. And we are also learning to say, you know, what the legal process, sometimes they are so delayed uh, by that the nature of the legal processes. But also to learn, I mean, there, there are a lot of issues we learn in terms of governance uh, issues, uh, which always has to play around. But, you know, as I said initially, you know, it will be difficult for us to say more and much uh, about, okay. but, I mean, we will always learn in terms of how things are being done. But I think for now, we know what is very difficult to say much, except to say, you know, what we are living in the constitutional democracy where people will challenge whatever decision they want to challenge, and we must just be patient with the, our legal processes. Thanks. Th thanks, uh, Advocate. All I wanted to say, without taking much of your time, Chair, to Honorable Tolashi, that the issue of agility is, is not only on legal issues, it's on the entire government processes. For instance, uh, we would have been confronted with situations where as the executive, you go on a hotla, you have a plan that this is this year, we must implement this program. Only find that 10% of that programs need an amendment to a legislation. You find that the legislation, the legislative process takes years to assist enabling a matter whose effects are expected in this current year. So a lot of our systems, be it in the executive, everywhere, the government system, there's a lot of work we need to do for agility, for the phenomenon of agility that you've spoken about, we need to be agile. That's why digitization uh, is long overdue, because if without digitization in the modern world, our planning processes are very static because you are, we are responding to ourselves, not to what is happening around ourselves globally and otherwise. But I think that point is actually taken. That's how far we go, Honorable Chair, and uh, we must thank you again for the opportunity. 
All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister, um, for that. I think whilst, of course, we, we, we applaud the, the good work and the progress that has been made, I think Mantolasha raises an issue about lessons learned. Uh, the lesson of inaction, insofar as these things not having been done when they should have been done, is that you are settled with a backlog. Um, and that some of the consequence management, which should have happened, will be lost to the system and people would have gotten away. And so really the point of agility, uh, effectiveness and efficiency, uh, cannot be overstressed. It, it just has to be the mainstay of functionality in government. And that, uh, Minister, I think it would serve well if there would be a full-scale assessment beyond this of identifying kunas and the bottlenecks and the overlaps which frustrate the flow of consequence management towards logical legal conclusions. Because when we initially raised this matter, uh, which is why we are here today as a committee, was we were concerned that the SIU would be doing work at the expense of the taxpayers, but the impact was not felt in the manner that was necessary because there was no implementation. Because the sad reality about corruption is that it costs money to prevent corruption, it costs money to recover money, and so on and so forth. But the cycle has to go, you know, full 360 in order for uh, the public to have a particular comfort that uh, wrongdoing is punished. And so it's quite clear just from this exercise that, and as you say, that you'll go to your hotline and find that there is a need for legislative changes. But let us look at what we already have and strengthen it. And it really brings you know, me to the point around the anti-corruption task team, the pooling and sharing of resources. Uh, the conveyor belt of prosecutions or the beneficiation outlook of prosecutions so that there's no duplication um, uh, and overlaps. So I think we accept that there's progress that has been made, but hindsight being the best sight is that uh, we, we, we really uh, must be more proactive in assessing uh, our systems to ensure that they are impactful. The second point is, uh, yes, of course, all citizens have got rights and uh, our democracy and constitution uh, gives them that, but rights come with responsibilities and rights come with accountability. And so we must not use the term patience uh, with ease, uh, because the South African public is not patient. Uh, and I, I really think we must, we, we must take, uh, we must be very cautious about the extent of the latitude which we are prepared to go to in accommodating one aspect of the reality of rights. The rights are a package. And they come with consequences, they come with responsibility, and they come with accountability, particularly if you have been given a position of authority in the public service space, whether in a political uh, capacity or an administrative capacity, because ultimately we're handling public funds. So I think uh, that there is also a need there as well to uh, ensure that the systems move with, 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 with a particular uh, speed. So, Minister, we, we thank you for the presentation this morning, and hopefully we will be in touch in the next quarter or session of Parliament uh, to gauge progress. I think from our side, colleagues, what will be important is an interaction with COCTA and SALGA uh, to assist this process on the municipal employees. Uh, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, the revolving door there is moving at full swing, uh, particularly now with the change of administrations, 
following the elections in November. Uh, people are nearly moving from one municipality to another with all sorts of things. Consideration uh, of the consequence management realities which they have to confront. So I think whilst we, 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 we are looking at what the presidency must do, I think we must assist this process ourselves uh, with actually interacting because we've raised this matter with COPTA before and public service and administration is also due to appear before us so that we actually close the door. But I think ultimately, a Minister, one of the things is that let us not speak about the fourth industrial revolution as some abstract reality in the far future. Certain things about identifying people and so on, I think of the past technology. Yeah. So there is a need for agility again in the technological capabilities of government uh, in the tracking of the movement, a comprehensive database. Uh, but of course, CETA has been a perennial headache uh, in this regard and not, not assisting uh, the agenda of a, a government with technological capabilities uh, to, 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 to keep up with the realities of our times. But again, yeah, I think colleagues, we can leave it at that. Um, I saw the hand of, if she is done, uh, I think, uh, colleagues, we, 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 we can be satisfied as a committee that uh, we, 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 we zoomed into something which is uh, beginning to take shape, not just on these SIU investigations, but on the broader scheme uh, of governance, uh, government consequence management. So thank you very much uh, to your team, and we will meet uh, in the next uh, 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 quarter. Much appreciated. Colleagues, if there's nothing else, I would like to leave this matter at that. Thank All you. Once. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you very much, Tim uh, Tibi, of course, as always. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, colleagues, let us take Parliament Legal now to take us through the, uh, the, 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 the legal opinion. So the context here, colleagues, is this. The Auditor General has submitted to Parliament the, um, uh, the audit opinion and the audit outcomes uh, as per the, the law because they have completed what they must do. But the matter in one aspect, uh, RAF is taking to court because they are challenging the findings and so on and so forth. So the annual report has not been submitted to parliament. And usually they come as a package because the uh, audit outcome would be featured into uh, the annual report. So you've got tabled audit outcomes and you no know, annual report. It's unprecedented. Um, uh, uh, what we've usually had uh, in the past is that there have been no submissions at all of anything. But here, the AG completed the work and put the dictates of the law, what uh, the AG must table to parliament. So the hearing was set, but the minister drew our attention to the fact that, of course, the matter is in court. <laughs> So I thought it prudent that let us consult uh, with Parliament Legal so that uh, we navigate these uncharted waters uh, together. So um, Parliament, I'm sure colleagues have the, the legal opinion. It was circulated a few days ago. But let us hand over then to Ume Fatima Ibrahim for, to, to, to take us through uh, that legal opinion. Uh, and then we, we so that we we are all we we in the clear in terms of how we take this uh, matter through. Parliament Legal, over to you. Um, thank you, Chair. And good morning to yourself and to the honourable members. Um, Chair, as you correctly point out, it's um, unprecedented. So we do hope that our opinion uh, paints a clear picture and assists the committee in the way forward. Um, as, you, as you indicated, our brief was um, to consider the impact on SCOPA specifically as regards the non-tabling now of the annual report, the financial statements and the audit report. Um, 
Chair, as, as um, you also indicated in your background, the minister was invited to attend a hearing on the annual report and financial statements for the 2020-2021 year, um, which as I understood it was meant to be on 17th of May 2022. And the minister then informed the committee that because of the pending judicial review by the RAF of the audit report, he has not tabled the annual report or the financial statements. And he also noted that in his view, Rule 89 of the National Assembly is applicable to this matter. So members may be familiar with that as being the, the so-called sub rule. And I'll explain a little bit more about that um, rule later on, Chair. Um, the minister also directed uh, the committee to the fact that he had tabled uh, a letter before the assembly on 30 March 2022, which outlines the reasons for the delay. Um, and he states that the, the review application may materially affect the content and the conclusions of the report. Um, and this was a, a second letter explaining the delay. There had previously been a letter tabled by the minister on 4 November 2021. Um, explaining at that time that AXA had yet to complete uh, the audit. Then the minister also further attached correspondence uh, received by himself from the RAF, uh, that was dated 13th of May, and there in uh, the RAF uh, talks of a host of procedural irregularities in the issuing of this audit report by the AXA. They also then request the minister to advise scope of this and to give consideration to the fact that there is no annual report. It does not exist and it cannot be finalized until this dispute um, is adjudicated in the courts. So the litigation, um, Chair, quite briefly, um, the RAF in compliance with the PFMA submitted the annual financial statements to the EXA for auditing. And on 25 June, AXA, this was last year, issued a finding that the use of the International Public Sector Accounting Standard 42 for social benefits, and this is an international accounting standard um, co commonly referred to as IPSAS 42, was an inappropriate accounting method for them to have used. And a dispute um, then ensued between the parties in respect of this accounting policy utilized by the RAC in the preparation of the financial statements. Um, and it was clear by July of last year that there was this material disagreement uh, between the parties. So it is the access contention that the RAF amended its accounting policy to recognize a claim liability and expenditure in, in accordance with IPSAS 42, which is in conflict uh, with GRAP, which is what would have been the applicable um, standards for the RAF to use. And they say that the result of this is that there is material misstatements in the claim expenditures, in the current and non-current liabilities, and in the disclosure notes. Um, and what you would have seen um, from the press, the, the big issue is that um, according to AXA, um, this change in the accounting policy has now resulted by what they call by the stroke of a pen in the removal of liabilities from the books exceeding 300 billion rand. The RAF, on the other hand, has taken the view that the, the International Financial Reporting Standards for, for insurance contracts, uh, which they previously used under the guidance of the Accounting Standards Board, um, and that is a board set up in terms of legislation, is deficient because it doesn't conceptually accommodate for the provision of social insurance. So members will be aware that the RAF is not a profit-generating uh, entity. So according to them, uh, that standard uh, therefore doesn't, doesn't work. The dispute wasn't settled internally and the parties appeared then to reach an impasse um, and the court documents reveal that they couldn't agree on whether the dispute was handled correctly. So in terms of the internal uh, dispute resolution processes that, that, are, that should be followed when um, a, an entity objects to the way in which the, the AG um, is making its findings. Nevertheless, the AG, notwithstanding all of this, still issued its disclaimer opinion and audit report on 20th of December 2021. Um, and according to them, they did so after referring the dispute to the Accountant General in the National Treasury Office, which confirmed that it agreed with the view of the AXA. Following this, 
Um, in January of this year, that then proceeded to institute legal proceedings in the Gauteng High Court. And what they sought to do was two things. One, to urgently interdict AXA from publishing the audit report, and this was part A of the proceedings. And then secondly, to review that actual audit report, and that was part B of the proceedings. Judgment was delivered on 24th of Feb um, in respect of part A. And there the court found that AXA is legally bound uh, by legislation to publish the audit report and the remedy of the death will lay in a review process as per part B of the proceedings. So consequently on 31 March, 2022, the AXA then issued and published the disputed audit report. Um, and the said report was then sent to the speaker on the same day. The actual review process chair must still, must still be heard. Um, in terms of the legal framework, um, the Road Accident Fund is a creature of statute. It's established in terms of the Road Accident Fund Act, and it's a public entity um, in terms of the PFMA, and therefore it's subject to the legal financial prescripts um, as contained in the PFMA. In terms of Section 6 of the RAP Act, their financial year runs from 1 April to 31 March, um, and Section 13 of that Act deals with the tabling of the annual report in Parliament. Um, and it says that the minister shall lay upon the table in Parliament a copy of the annual report within 30 days after receipt thereof, if Parliament is then in session. So not much detail in, in that Act itself, but the Public Finance Management Act sets it out more clearly, and this is the Act that would, would trump um, the DAF Act in any event. Um, members are aware that the objective of the PFMA is to ensure transparency, accountability, and sound management of the revenue, expenditure, assets, and liabilities of the institutions it regulates. And Chair, I mentioned this specifically because members must apply their mind to what the purpose behind tabling um, of these documents is um, when deciding on the way forward. So in terms of Section 55 of the PM PFMA, the board of the RAF would have to prepare their financial statements um, in accordance with generally accepted accounting practice, um, unless the accounting standards board approves um, a different uh, recognized accounting practice. They need to submit those statements to the auditors, in this case, the EXA for auditing within two months after the end of the financial year, which we, we know that they did do. And then within five months of the end of the financial year, uh, submit the annual report, audited financial statements, and the report of the auditors on those statements to the Treasury and the Executive Authority, which in this case would be the Minister of Transport, um, in order that the Minister can then table in Parliament. This is the step now that has not been done. The Minister, in turn, is responsible in terms of Section 65 to table that annual report, financial statements, and audit report within one month after the accounting um, authority for the public entity received the audit report. So basically this is in line with what the RAF Act um, also dictates. If an executive authority fails to table the necessary reports, it must table a written explanation in the legislature setting out the reasons why they were not tabled. And the Auditor General may also then issue a special report on the delay. Um, the PFMA Chair has a lacuna insofar as it does not deal further with steps to be taken following the table, the tabling of such an explanation. So what happens, um, in other words, where there's an explanation, but there isn't a commitment to a specific date, um, how is it dealt with? That, that is absent um, from the law as it stands. Then the Public Audit Act, um, Chair, in terms of that act, quite briefly, the ACSA must submit its, uh, an audit report in accordance with legislation that would be applicable to the auditee, and in this case, it would be the RAF Act and the PFMA. And then it also provides that audit reports must be tabled in the legislature in accordance with any applicable legislation or otherwise within a reasonable time. And when audit report is not so tabled within one month after that, um, after the actor having submitted the report, it must promptly publish the audit report. And it was on this basis um, and on this provision that AXA then proceeded uh, to publish its report. Um, Chair, you'll recall that I mentioned earlier that the minister did raise the sub um, rule in his letter. 
that rule is a common law rule, Chair, and it, li it limits public comment that may prejudice the administration of justice um, in respect of matters under judicial consideration. And it seeks to protect the rights of persons to a fair trial in both civil and uh, criminal matters and to prevent the undue influence of judges and in other countries, the undue influence of juries. Um, the application of that rule has changed significantly since the final constitution. And there is a seminal judgment um, on the matter, which is the media television case. Uh, members may recall um, some years ago a matter where um, there was a baby, Jordan, who was murdered when she was six months old when um, assailants entered uh, the home of the child. And what had happened uh, following that matter is that ETV, the broadcaster, had conducted several interviews uh, with family members and other persons and had produced a documentary. They then wanted to air this documentary after the arrest of the uh, suspected assailants. And ETV sought to block this uh, based on the, on the sub judicate rule because this um, criminal matter was still going to unfold before the courts. And there, the court um, ruled that the sub and this was a, a SCA decision, that the sub rule would only apply um, if it's prejudicial to the administration of justice in allowing free speech, uh, and that that prejudice is demonstrable and substantial. And then, if there is a real risk that the prejudice will occur if debate takes place, so simple conjecture or speculation that it may raise uh, prejudice will not be enough, and then a court would be satisfied that the disadvantage of curtailing the free speech outweighs its advantage. And here the court looks specifically at this right um, to free speech, which is contained in the Constitution. Obviously, this, this case um, is slightly, slightly distinguishable from what is happening before Parliament, even though it also deals with the issue of free speech. So in further unpacking that case, what, what we can also see is that most of the issues that would be before the, um, the NA and the NCRP would already be extensively reported on in the media. And usually they are in the public realm. That was certainly the case um, with this matter. And then the risk of a member of parliament or an official providing information to the NA that is contradictory to information they would have to provide to a court um, would not be a factor in determining if there will be prejudice uh, to the administration of justice. So, Chair, taking all of that into consideration, um, we then looked at it and uh, also looked more closely at what the role of AXA is and then the oversight role of, of Parliament. So we know that the AXA is the Supreme Audit Institution of the Republic. They play a key role in promoting financial accountability. And they provide independent assurance to both Parliament and the public um, that financial statements and financial um, administration of government departments are in order. And, and the role of the AXA is then complemented by Parliament. Um, and Parliament obviously places reliance on the AXA because they are the ones that are the experts in financial accounting and financial administration. That is not a skill uh, that necessarily resides um, in Parliament. The AXA has, in accordance with its own act, published the audit report of the REF, and the publication, as I indicated, Chair, occurred notwithstanding this ongoing disagree disagreement between the parties and this pending uh, review application. Chair, it is beyond the scope of this opinion to reflect or consider whether the AXA is correct um, in its assertions that the incorrect accounting policy was utilized or an inappropriate accounting policy. Uh, this forms the subject of the review before the courts. What is important for us, though, is that the AXA has issued the audit um, report. And in the absence of an interdict, as I explained, Part A, which was the attempt to interdict the publication of that um, audit report, failed. It means that the report is of legal force and effect. So in law, we say that the AXA is, by discharging this function of publishing the report, uh, functus officio. So in other words, the AXA cannot go back on what it's done now. The only remedy that the REF has um, is if a competent court now sets aside the access report. So for all intents and purposes, um, that report is um, of full legal effect and binding. In terms of the PFMA and the REF Act, 
uh, the regulatory calendar for the tabling um, of these reports has passed. The minister, as I indicated, requested an extension previously, um, but how? But notwithstanding that the um, that the audit uh, report has been issued uh, more than five months ago, in fact, none of the rest of the documents that would form part of the package. Um, have been tabled. And in fact, the minister has not tabled the um, audit report that was provided to parliament uh, by AXA itself. Um, so the, the, the provision would have been triggered when the board received the audit report from the AXA. Um, they then created the legal obligation on the minister to table the reports uh, by 20 January 2022, which would have been a month after they had received the audit report. The minister has, has indicated that he hasn't tabled the report on the basis that it's being subjected to a review process, but presumably Chair, the minister also finds himself um, in somewhat of a quandary because um, according to the letter from the RAF, they do not have an annual report. So clearly the minister then can't be in possession of this annual report, um, which the RAF is insisting that it can't finalise. And because these document, documents are ordinary, ordinarily tabled and considered together um, as one, as a complete set, it means that the minister is not in a position uh, to table in the, in the normal sense of, of how you would do in respect of any other entity. Um, and Chair, as you also pointed out, we usually look at the documents all together in order to paint uh, the full picture of what the financial health of an entity is. The contention by that chair that the annual report does not exist is, is, is somewhat concerning because ordinarily that report should have been prepared together with the financial statements. Um, it's clear that the RAF is willing to defend um, their financial statements and the way in which it was put together. And similarly, chair, it's our view that they should be able to defend the annual report in any oversight um, process, regardless of what the opinion and the qualifications of the AXA may have been in respect um, of the audit report. However, Chair, I, I am aware this may be a simplification of the matter and that that would be a uh, best place to come in and report an account to the committee as to why it can't uh, be done. Uh, Chair, for the reasons, um, and I explained in terms of the sub rule and the application of the test there, we are of the view that Assembly Rule 89 does not find um, application in this matter at all. The, according to that media judgment, there must be a demonstrable and substantial prejudice uh, to the administration of justice in allowing the free speech, and there must be a real risk uh, that the prejudice will occur if debate takes place. And it's unclear, Chair, how an oversight exercise carried out by Parliament will create any such real uh, risks. In any event, the role of the court is to adjudicate on the technicalities in respect of the accounting standard used and whether there was a legal basis for such standard to be used. Whereas the oversight process um, instead focuses on issues pertaining to the financial health um, of the road accident fund. Uh, furthermore, Chair, the, the RAF is a public entity which raises revenue in the form of a fuel levy, which is payable by every motorist in the Republic. And the functions of the RAC also apply to every road user, whether you're a driver, a passenger, or pedestrian. Its reach, therefore, impacts very widely in one way or another on um, almost every single person in the country. One would be hard placed to think of anyone um, other than somebody that may be confined to their home that doesn't use a road in some way or the other. So, therefore, there is um, huge public interest um, and a right for the public to know what is happening in the financial affairs uh, for the RAF. In any event, Chair, the dispute has already unfolded publicly, and in seeking reprieve through the courts, the RAF had already set out the salient facts applicable to the dispute, and this big issue um, about the liability in particular that I noted um, when, I, when I introduced the matter. Also, Chair, the audit report is already publicly released. Based on that, um, Chair, we concluded that the sub judicate rule isn't applicable, and in any event, um, the constitutional functions of Parliament cannot be trumped by internal rules and processes of Parliament itself. Um, the rules itself have to be subject uh, to the Constitution. 
and that rule should not be used to frustrate the oversight processes um, of Parliament. If that were the case, um, persons and institutions could simply turn to the court to frustrate oversight um, processes and then effectively render Parliament disabled every single time a committee, whether it be SCOPA um, or any other committee, um, wants to call uh, persons or institutions to account. That, that's obviously an untenable um, situation and Parliament would never be able to function. So in our view, Chair, the oversight mandate of Parliament and in particular the financial oversight mandate of this committee should not be stifled by the litigation processes. Uh, members will be aware that these process, processes can take years uh, to resolve. There can be appeals and so on. Um, and the oversight process is instrumental for accountability, but also it empowers Parliament in other ways because it informs our budgetary allocations and then is also important when we consider issues related to legislative reform and so on. So this information is important um, for, many, for many reasons and it can't simply um, be pushed aside while we wait for court processes to un unfold. So as I've said, the, the fact of the matter is quite simply that that auditor report um, as, as presented by AXA is of legal force and effect, and it must be considered in terms of Assembly Rule 245.1. Um, and the minister and the board should attend any engagements with SCOPA to scrutinize the auditor report. And the RAF, of course, is at liberty in such an engagement to respond to the findings of the AXA and to provide clarity to SCOPA on this concern around liabilities as well as any other financial matter. They can explain why they use the standard they use, why they think it's correct, and, and defend their position. Um, Chair, we do think that the minister should be asked to account to the committee on the issue of the failures to secure the annual report from the RAF, notwithstanding the review process. The tabling of an explanation for the delay does not absolve the minister from the responsibility to comply with the tabling prescripts um, in the PFMA. So in other words, um, the tabling of an explanation won't obviate the requirement for Parliament to fulfil its oversight duties. If the annual report cannot be finalised pending the review, and, and they would need to come to the committee to explain why, then the Minister should be directed to have regard to whether a provisional annual report um, can be issued in the meantime. So a provisional report that would include any necessary provisos that hinge um, on the outcome of the review application. And the reason we say this, Chair, is because that annual report doesn't only contain um, information related to, to pure financial issues, but it also, it also contains information on governance processes, human resource management, performance information, and all of these are important for Parliament to fulfil its oversight mandate. It can't be done in the absence of that. You know, this is where you're going to find statistics, this is where you're going um, to find out whether the entity is being run properly, where, the, where there are gaps, um, where changes need to be made, and so on. So we advise that um, SCOPA perhaps also contact the National Treasury to obtain independent advice on the issuing of provisional annual reports where the audited financial statements are disputed. The PFMA doesn't provide a mechanism for, um, for an annual report in this form, but we can't see that there would be any legal reason uh, prohibiting same. And likewise, Chair, there would be no reason why um, if the review application um, is successful by the RAF, that Parliament can't uh, <laughs> hold further meetings after that um, to discuss the issue further with the RAF. But to simply sit back um, and wait for the litigation processes to unfold can't be done. And for now, uh, there is no doubt that SCOPA is legally required to at least look at the, the audited financial statements, because as I've indicated, those are of full legal force and effect. But we also don't think that the issue of the annual report um, should be ignored and there should be some follow up in that regard. Chair, that concludes um, our legal opinion. I'm happy to take any questions if members require any clarity. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, May Ibrahim. Really appreciate that thorough briefing. Colleagues, over to you. Please indicate if you wish to uh, speak. Honorable 
Uh, what? Uh, right, colleagues, I thought I was seeing a hand in the WhatsApp group. Honorable Van Minen. Thank you very much, Chair. Look, I think it's relatively straightforward. I think we do need to have a hearing and the minister and everyone needs to come and actually discuss this with Scopa. This is something that has to go forward and we can't allow it to get um, delayed by various extraneous factors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Fulman. Honorable Samia. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I would uh, propose that uh, you expose the uh, minister on the advice and uh, therefore organize that they should come to the committee uh, on the basis of that advice. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Any other hand, colleague? Colleagues? All right. But no, I think um, that, that clarifies the issue. Chair, my it is up, please, Chair. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mam Tolashi. My apologies. Over to you, Mom. No, thanks very much, Chair. I appreciate the, the presentation. I also agree with Ocom, Honorable Somio. But also, just I'm being, I am just curious to know how much did the department spend on this to and from kind of a, a situation? If, if the minister can just take us through how much did they spend in all this so that the we can know and also the public can get to understand the kinds of, of, of things that we're dealing with, with the people that are custodians of the laws of this country. I just want to, to put that so that we can all be aware and we we'll further engage later on when we get those figures. Thanks. Okay, it's fine. I think what we will do is we will leave, uh, we'll put those questions to them uh, accordingly. Uh, for now, I think we've gotten the clarity that um, the, 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 they must come and, and, and appear before us in the structure and work of that. Um, because you see, this, the, the, this headache of the sub care rule continues to linger over Parliament every time it tries to move uh, on a matter. It's like a scarecrow. It's a perennial scarecrow. Um, and um, I think the clarity we have received uh, is, is absolutely uh, uh, you know, clear for us. And uh, I think we should be fine. Right? Uh, Honorable Hatebe and Honorable Bukas and Honorable Somio, uh, in that order, please. Thank you, um, Honorable Chair. I had difficulties, Chair, in um, understanding and accepting the issue of subjudy care. I'll tell you why, Chair. The bone of contention here, having failed, to interdict uh, or the general of South Africa from um, publishing the report. Now, part B is disputing um, the content of the report, which includes um, setting aside the findings or rendering them um, unlawful. The second aspect is that having read the report, they are also appealing the first part. And uh, the court has said, but the judgment was reserved on the appeal. Why am I highlighting these issues and I'm raising these issues, Chair? If we were to continue as a committee, um, having read the report of the AG and its finding, ours is to hold Ralph accountable in terms of 
the disclaim audit opinion. And we'll be discussing on the basis that we place our reliance on the outcome of the audit by AG, which at this current juncture, it's subject to review. And if we were to continue and hold Ralph accountable on the basis that they've obtained a disclaim or the opinion and base our debate and understanding on a disclaim or the opinion and hold them accountable as such into failing to ensure a clean audit is obtained. Hypothetically speaking, what if then the court rule um, in favor of Ralph after having uh, arrived at certain recommendation as this committee that based on one to three, we recommend this what should happen. Based on the PFMA, the act is clear, meaning you have failed to do one to three. We recommend that certain consequence management uh, be implemented. Whoever um, effected the change in accounting policy should be subject to disciplinary action, action had to be taken. They have dealt with this matter with uh, uh, an opted for a standard which is not prescribed with directive five. I'm just saying all those issues. And then we arrive at the conclusion where uh, we, we effect consequence management and we demand action against all those. In an event where the court rule otherwise, when we have uh, recommended and given a, a certain recommendation, uh, hypothetically speaking, and the Ralph act on those uh, recommendation based on a disclaim or the opinion, uh, what what will happen? I just need clarity. What would happen in that situation should the court rule otherwise? I'm not saying it will do that, but I just want uh, us to look into uh, the balance of probabilities in our action. It's uh, the, 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 the case that was cited um, about ETV, um, it's different with our function as the committee because ETV would have not recommended any actions to be taken based on, on that uh, publication. But ours, uh, when we read the report, at some point, we are not just reading the report to note it, would have to recommend certain actions to be taken based on the disclaim audit opinion, based on the supposedly 27 uh, billion liability, which previously it was 330 billion. So all those things need to be taken into account. Hence, I'm seeking clarity in an event where we take certain decisions based on what we have at our disposal, and the court ruled otherwise, what would then be the remedy in that case? Check. Can I just get clarity from the legal um, uh, person? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Honorable Bukas. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, in agreeing and accepting the, the opinion, especially on, on point 38, uh, that we must engage with, with Treasury. Uh, can't we engage Treasury also on the use of this new accounting policy? Uh, why is it that some entities make use of this policy while the, well, whilst the AGC is uh, inappropriate? Uh, because I think it's the same thing that we discover in ESCOM, Chair. So it's just it's just for clarity. Thank you. Or proposal. No, that 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 uh, engagement with Treasury must be uh, pinned down as a matter of priority in dealing with this matter. You're quite right, and I think Honourable Hatteb is uh, spending the work. So conundrum is worth considering. All right, Honourable Sonia. Thank you very much. I, I, I think um, uh, in the same breath, uh, National Tre Treasury is, uh, is, is critical because the Auditor General audits on the basis of standards, 
which are approved by the accountant general, which is a treasury instrument. And uh, they, they, so, so the AG does not possess uh, uh, any right in terms of uh, uh, adopted uh, a standard. Uh, so, so, so it's, it's a national treasury uh, standard which has been issued, understood, and every entity, uh, therefore, uh, need to follow. I, I take it that that's why uh, National Treasury is supportive of each and every step that the AG takes. It, it will therefore be necessary uh, that they are party uh, to any engagements which have to ensue uh, with regard to uh, uh, this uh, this matter uh, going uh, going forward. If if indeed they were not necessarily party to, that would have been a different a different factor because no institution uh, is free to adopt any other form of a standard which is not necessarily an approved standard uh, by uh, the custodian. Uh, which is national treasury in this in this in this instance. So so uh, um, whether on the basis of this uh, legal uh, advice and as well uh, with the uh, insistence uh, on the final tabling of the report by the Auditor General, which is a a, a mute matter. As, as one would um, um, uh, look into it uh, currently because uh, the, the report has been tabled, uh, uh, in fact, submitted uh, to uh, the relevant legislature, which is the National Assembly, and, and therefore, in this instance, the matter which relates to such uh, remains uh, a mute because the report is public. And if it is public, it, it then becomes uh, the responsibility uh, of the committee if there are issues which ought to be engaged to deal with those matters. So the starting matter um, uh, here would be national treasury uh, confirmation uh, into the current standing in as far as standards adopted uh, are concerned. Even if I want to move forward to look into other parties like your Department of uh, uh, Transport and uh, RAF, per se. Um, that's, that's, another, that's another matter. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, right, uh, May Ibrahim, let's get your uh, reaction to particularly the question by Honorable Debe. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, that, that is the only one that requires a response. Chair, the legal difficulty that the committee sits with is that as it stands today, that audit report is of full um, legal effect and is binding. And in turn, the rules now require um, scope of the for to consider it. Of course, Chair, there are no rules in how oversight is conducted. And certainly this issue that is playing out in the background is going to be something that informs uh, the committee going forward, the way in which the committee deals um, with the matter. And it's something that the committee is going to have to apply its mind to um, during these, these yearlings um, on, on the issues related to the RAF. That being said, Chair, there, there are matters that, um, won't, that won't be affected by the use of the accounting standard, perhaps. So issues um, related, for example, to SCM, uh, to SCM matters, um, where disciplinary yearlings maybe need to be um, instituted, where there needs to be implementation of better controls or enhancement of environment and so on, there would be no reason why those sorts of recommendations can't be made. Where there are going to be recommendations that are specifically affected by what is playing out in court, the committee would have to consider that more closely and, and get some feedback from the RAF as to why um, on the back of the court process those, um, uh, those improvements, for example, can't be made. So that, that can only happen as the matter um, plays out before the committee. 
Um, oversight is a is a fluid process, Chair. So if I if I use a simple example of during COVID, if we were if we were um doing oversight over Stat South Africa, let's just say, um, for example, and we expected them to have gone house to house to do the census and they come to report to the committee and they haven't completed the census by the date that they they ought to have completed it and the explanation there is well because of COVID there's been delays we we were prohibited from walking the streets and doing house to house we needed to come up um, with new online systems etc cetera, etc cetera. the committee would obviously take that into account and and quite similarly yeah the bottom line is is that we need to hear from the ref and we need to hear from the minister um directly at the moment you are sitting with a with um a document that is legally binding and i think therefore the committee uh, must deal with it and can't simply uh, push it into the shadows waiting for this um litigation process to unfold but it will certainly uh, impact your deliberations going forward thank you honorable chair yes honorable Hart. I'm not sure whether it's my network, but I've lost the, the the. It's possibly your network. No, I'm saying. Uh, uh, Honorable Hatebe, we are losing you on our end. It's and then he's gone. All right, um, colleagues. I think um, we'll see if he comes back in. But I, I, I think the, the legal opinion uh, structures in a particular outlook. Of course, we'll have to um, consider all the variables, um, uh, you know, of this matter, um, and then be in a position to structure a, a hearing with the uh, with REF and Department of Transport, uh, because what we are settled with is that the the, the the auditor general has submitted to parliament so the, 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 that audit outcome has been tabled notwithstanding um, the the realities of litigation that are there and i i i take what, mainly the point that this litigation could be open ended uh, and in the event therefore that it does become such it does ref continue on an outlook of not being held accountable because there's a matter in court. I think that dilemma is, is, is of, a, of that kind of blank check is one that they, they give in. Uh, we need to keep it on, on, on a short leash on this. Ref has been a headache for quite a while now. And um, the, this litigation turns it into a migraine uh, because a quite, Clearly, for me, it's, indi it's indicative of the extent of the problems at RAF uh, in some sort of Stalingrad now of a. Chairman. Yeah, so I think. Then, we'll sit, all right, Honorable Hadebe, we lost you there. Uh, I think it's your network because quite clearly, I said we were able to hear the legal. Yes, my, my network is failing me. Uh, okay. Senzenja. Can you hear me now? Proceed, I'll let you know when you break. All right, um, I think Honorable... Honorable Hade. Chair. Babusan. I'm Chair Luhadebe. I'm Chair Luhadebe. I'm Chair Luhadebe. I'm Chair Luhadebe. Honorable Hatebe, Honorable Hatebe, Uzo I think, colleagues, for, okay, for now. No, um, okay. I, I was saying, to, am, am, am I still struggling to be heard? No. Speak whilst you have network. We can hear you. She, she is. All right. No, that Honorable Latab is not winning. We will discuss if he's got any other issues, we can discuss them as a committee moving forward ahead of our meeting. Let me Yeah, see. no, it's a case sabotage, Chair. Hey, it's a sabotage, Chair. Yeah. 
No, it's fine. Let's let's discuss these matches moving forward as we structure the the, the meeting with Ref and Department of Transport, um, and then we will see how. Yeah, we... if if you can hear me, I also wanted to say. Ah, uh, honorable uh, Lakab, you're not winning, but the um, accounting uh, um, uh, uh, what what you. Uh, you don't say what you want to say. Say it. All right. I think, colleagues, let's bring it to an end on that note. Honorable Hatebe will brief us uh, in due course of the issues that he wants to raise, uh, and we'll see how we take it through. Let me take this opportunity and thank uh, Mami Ibrahim, as usual, uh, for uh, the very thorough um, briefing. Uh, that she has provided us uh, on this matter. Um, and then we as a committee will, will take it forward uh, within the, the parameters of the guide in which we have been given and also apply our own due consideration to the issues as been fit. Colleagues, thanks Thank you very much uh, to you. Tomorrow we are meeting with the Minister of Higher Education and Training Science and Innovation. Uh, on, 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 on the outstanding matters uh, of um, forensic investigations into national skills fund, among others. So that meeting is tomorrow at uh, 9.30, uh, the usual time uh, of, for the committee to, to meet. So colleagues, thank you very much. And to our uh, secretariat, uh, thank you. Uh, we will meet tomorrow at 9.30. On that note, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.